Hey, Village Church and everybody church. It's great to see you. Today, my name is Ray Waters Jr. and I'm coming to you from Orange County, California. I uh, wanted to do a couple songs with you. Found an old hymn book lying around, so decided to uh, crack it open. You might recognize some of these, put a, our own little spin on it, um, but I think you'll enjoy it. And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way To prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore we shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed and the spirit shall sorrow no more not a sigh for the blessings of rest oh in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet Find our rest, sweet by and by. There are questions will be answered. And no more tears will dim the eye. Cause there the orphans not forgotten. Find our rest, sweet by and by. Well, good morning, Village Church. I'm so glad that you're watching, and uh, I'm so excited as a father. I'm so excited to have my oldest son, Ray Kendrick Waters, leading our worship. He was the worship leader at the village for a long time before he took his family and four children to the West Coast, and they have been living there now for, I don't know, six, seven, eight years, and we only get to see him once or twice a year at the village, and so... Because of COVID, I called him and said, hey, would you do the music this Sunday? And so I'm so grateful that he's uh, leading us this morning, and he's got another song that he's going to do in just a minute, and it just makes uh, this dad's heart feel very, very full, and I feel very honored. I want to share with you uh, three ways you can give if you'd like to support what we are doing at The Village. And we say don't feel pressured about this ever, but some people would like to be a part of what we're trying to do here 
Um, so if you want to, these are what these are the ways you can do it. You can text the word GIVE to 404-998-8979. Simple process. It'll walk you right through it. Or you can go to our website, thevillageatlanta.com slash GIVE. Simple process, easy peasy to do. Or you can do the old-fashioned way and send a check to the Village Church, 3418 Dogwood Drive in Hapeville, Georgia, 30354. If you can help us, it means the world to us, and we appreciate the help when it is, comes in very, very much. I want to say a prayer for you before Ray sings another song, and then we have a very special service in store for you, a message in store for you, and I'm so glad that you're with us. But I want to pray for you first, all right? God, thank you for this day. Thank you for every person who is watching. Thank you for this church that we get to be a part of, the Village Church, this beautiful place where all people are loved and welcomed. Thank you for the people who are able to help us and for those who pray for us and those who watch on Sundays. Thank you so much for this day. And we ask your blessings on all that we're gonna do now. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Some glad morning when this life is over I fly away to that home on God's celestial shore I'll fly away I'll fly away oh glory I'll fly away when I die hallelujah by and by I'll fly away Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away To that land where joy will never end I'll fly away I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away When I die, hallelujah, by and by I'll fly away When I die Hallelujah by and by I'll fly away Hey, The Village, my home away from home down in Atlanta. It's good to be with you again. Uh, found out yesterday that I was going to be speaking to you this Sunday. Uh, I think Ray was looking to get out of work. He's sitting over here right now taking it easy, laughing at me. But um, I am always honored and privileged to be with you guys. And I guess this is the first time I've been in this format um, for recording a sermon for the village with nobody here. So I'm just going to look into the camera and remember all of your smiling faces and look forward with fondness to when I can hug your neck again and you can hug mine. I'm going to uh, do something today that's rare for me. I'm going to teach a new lesson, something I have not taught before. So you guys are, it really depends on how you want to look at it. You are going to get something fresh and new from me, or you're going to be my guinea pigs that I'm practicing on, maybe a little bit of both. But I've been talking about this particular idea to Ray for the last couple of days, and it has just, uh, honestly, it's just lit me up, and I hope that I can do it justice. I'm always nervous the first time I present something because something as good as this, I don't, I don't know that I can even possibly do it justice, but I'm going to try. And the effort's going to include me reading a lot of scripture. So I, I hope you like the Bible. I certainly do. 
because I just keep coming back to this book over and again and finding things that remind me of why against all odds and against some people's reason, I continue to find myself a devoted follower of Christ and a lover of Christianity. I know that we've made our gaffes and we've done a lot of harm along the way, but I also think there's a lot of beauty in this faith. And while I might not always look like I'm living at the uh, capital of Christianity, I do find myself within its borders and very satisfied by the lessons that I just keep learning again and again and again from Jesus and the biblical text. So with that disclaimer or whatever it was, that preface, I want to jump into the text. I'm going to walk through about five biblical texts, and I, I hope this doesn't wear you out, but there's some really powerful stuff in here. The first text, well, let me back up and just say this. The context for me personally of this lesson and the context out of which this was born uh, really has a lot to do with my advocacy work for the LGBTQ community. And that is compounded in a positive way by what's happening culturally right now in the West, specifically the Black Lives Matter. If we are not thinking about the marginalized, the underserved, those who have been pushed from the center of society and mistreated, if we're not thinking right now about things like the distribution and misdistribution of wealth, goods, and means, then I think we're tone deaf. And even worse, I think we're soul deaf or deaf. And I think that does lead to a horrible death, an internal death. So in that context of thinking about serving the marginalized communities and lifting people, uh, these texts have come alive to me in a way that I wouldn't have predicted. So I'm going to start with uh, a, a scripture that's been quoted and requoted, uh, a very, very important scripture in the context of Christian life and specifically Christian theology. And that's Paul's letter to the Philippians, the second chapter. And I'm going to read the first eight verses and maybe give commentary as I go along. So just bear with me. I think if you do, it's going to be worth it because I'll pull all of this together in the end. Paul said, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation from love, if there's any sharing in the Spirit, if there's any compassion and sympathy, Paul was a poet, and that's one of the things that makes him such a tremendous theologian. He didn't just write you know, pedantic, stilted prose, he wrote poetically. Listen to that verse again. If there's any encouragement in Christ, obviously this is a rhetorical question that's inferring that obviously and for sure there is encouragement in Christ. But Paul said if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's anything good about Jesus, if there's any help that we get from the story of our Lord, if there's any consolation that comes to us from this idea of love, if there's any sharing in the Spirit, capital S, sharing in God, if there's any compassion and sympathy, Paul speaks to the church as a pastor, a literary pastor, albeit, but as the founder of this community. And he says, please make my joy complete. Be of that same mind, the encouraging mind of Christ, the consoling love of Jesus, the sharing of spirit that comes from God. Make my joy complete, he said. Be like that. Be of the same mind. Having the same love as Jesus. Being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Remember the context, the lens. We're thinking about, we're thinking about our relationship to marginalized communities. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Do nothing from a place of conceit. But in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Now, this is hyperbole, obviously, because Jesus taught us and the Torah taught us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So the place of health is to not love our neighbor more than ourselves or less than ourselves, but to love all of us, including ourselves and others, even our enemies with equanimity, equality. But the hyperbole here is obvious or it's done for obvious reasons. We should be in humility regarding others as better than ourselves. This is an affirmative action of sorts that's saying we're going to have to counterbalance the fact that we've been selfish. 
that we've been conceited, that we've put ourselves first, that we've thought of ourselves as more important than others. So we're going to contradict that now by going to the other extreme for a while until this balances out. Let each of you look not to your own interest. Again, this is an exaggerated statement that's really saying, don't look only to your own interest, but look to the interest of others. Let the same mind, here's the wrap up, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Now, this is the deeply theological part on which we have built our creeds and our Christology. Paul said, speaking of Jesus, who, though or in spite of the fact he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Now think about that. Jesus, the Son of Man, the perfect Son of Man, the human archetype. Before he was the human archetype among us, he was in the form of God. He was very God of very God, the creeds say. And yet his perspective as being in the form of God, equal with God, the Father, the Spirit, was not something that he believed he should exploit. What does it mean to exploit that? He didn't believe it was something that he should hoard. He didn't think it was something that he should use inappropriately. He didn't think it was something that he should use to his own advantage. He didn't think it was something he should use uh, regardless of what other people have need of. He believed that this gift, being in the form of God, was something that he had to steward without selfish ambition and without conceit, but in love and in the spirit, Paul said, of sharing. So this is the way he did that. What did Jesus do with the knowledge that he was God, that he was above all things? He was above death. He was above bigotry. He was above bias. He was above injustice. He was above hatred. He was above pain. Above all of those things, this is what he did. He emptied himself. The opposite of exploiting that position was to leave that position. He emptied himself. Watch this. Being in the form of God, he emptied himself and he took on himself the form of a slave. From God to a slave, not just from God to a human, but his first description as a human being was a human being in the form of a slave, at least from the perspective of Paul. Paul never spoke of the nativity. Paul never spoke of Jesus as a baby. He never spoke of Jesus as a child, though those things are certainly true and good and have meaning. When Paul did his theology, he went past the nativity. He went past the barrenness of a virgin womb. He went past the poverty of Jesus' social location in Nazareth. And he went to the lowest of low, to the greatest injustice, perhaps a human, one of the greatest injustice that a human can suffer, and that is the injustice of slavery. Who being in the form of God, thought being God was not something that should be exploited, hoarded, held on to, but he emptied himself. Now this is very important. He didn't cease being God. He didn't empty himself of his identity. He didn't empty himself of his divinity. He could not cease being God. But he emptied himself, not of being God, but he emptied himself of the rights and privileges of being God. He emptied himself of all of the advantages that come with sitting on that divine throne. And he came down. In Philippians 2, this is referred to theologically as the kenosis, which simply means the pouring out. What did he pour out? He poured out all of the rights and privileges of his divinity. And he replaced the rights and privileges of his, of his divinity with the injustice that a slave endures. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself. One of the beauties of Christianity is we serve a humble God. We teach the story of a humble God. 
a God who could not be humbled by any other, a God who could not be brought low by any other, but a God who demanded by his own integrity and character that he be humbled, so he humbled himself. And what did humility mean for God? It meant that he had to join the estate, the lowest, the most hurting estate, the most suffering estate of his creation. He had to join that lowest estate in a place of solidarity. He had to hook up the central nervous system of the divine to the central nervous system of those unjustly treated. And he had to feel what we feel. As Max Licato said, he took off the rubber gloves, he took off the chain mail, he took off the armor, and he came. And he was not just among us, he was with us. He was one of us. He made himself a slave. And not only a slave, but he became obedient to the point of death. And not even death, but he became obedient, Paul said, even to death on a cross the cruelest form of death known to humankind at that time, the most unjust form of suffering that could be exacted on a human being. Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought equality with God was not something to be grasped, not something to be clung to. But the integrity of Jesus, the human archetype, was to come low and find solidarity with those who are most hurting. Savor that for a minute. Think about that in the context of your own privilege. The privilege of males over and against females. The privilege of the able over and against the disabled. The privilege of people who are white over and against the, the disadvantages that so many people of color face. The privilege of cisgender people over and against the transgender. The privilege of straight people over and against homosexual, bisexual, pansexual people. The context here is that ever and again, Jesus is leaving us with a model of what those of us that sit in high places of privilege, those of us who sit like turtles on a fence post, knowing that we did nothing to get up there except simply be born by happenstance in a particular area, in a particular geography, to a particular family with a particular brain chemistry or skin tone. What are we to do when we find ourselves? in those places of graced privilege, there is only one thing to do, and that is to let go of them, to not grasp them, to not hold on to them, to not allow them to serve only us and our advantage, but again, to find the encouragement that comes in Christ, the consolation that comes from love, which is the sharing in spirit, which is being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and solidarity with all people, nothing being done from selfish ambition or conceit that thinks I'm more important than others, but to humble myself until I come down into a place of shared suffering, of shared disadvantage. The greatest sages that we have ever known, the greatest social activists we have ever known, the Mother Teresas and the Mandelas, they do not do their work, generally they do not do their work, and then at night go back to their gated community. The Dorothy Days, the great social worker in New York, these are people who follow after Christ, the Gandhis of this world, they follow after Christ and they make their way to the estate of those they serve. That's the first scripture. The second scripture embodies incarnately in the life of Jesus that which was just theoretically proposed by Paul. Paul is doing theological retrospect. He's looking back at the life of Jesus and he's giving us these incredibly powerful poetic statements of theology. Now the gospel writer John looks back at the actual life of Jesus and says, here's what that looked like on the ground. This is the night before Jesus was crucified. It was before Passover, and Jesus knew. Now, listen to what he knew. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world. Now, Jesus knew when he left this world, he wasn't going, he wasn't going down into the earth to stay in the grave. He knew when he left this world, he wasn't going down into hell to be tortured forever. Jesus knew that he was going back to where he came from. That's a heady piece of knowledge. That is a consoling piece of knowledge. 
the advantages, the privileges, the rights of divinity that he had emptied himself of, he was going back to that place. Listen to what he did. When he knew the time had come for him to leave this world and return to the Father, he had always loved his followers in this world, and he loved them to the very end. Thomas doubted, Peter denied, Judas betrayed, but he loved them all the same to the end. Each of them had different ends, but however distant that end was, he loved them all the way to that place. Even before the evening meal started, the devil had come into Judas, the son of Simon, and Judas had decided to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that he had come from God. And Jesus knew that he was going back to God. He also knew, here is a statement that blows me away. He also knew that the Father had given him complete power. I don't know how, but I had missed this for so many years. Theologically, I was taught, doctrinally, I was taught that Jesus reassumed all of the power after the death, after the burial, after the resurrection, and ultimately after the ascension when he went back into the heavens. But this text said Jesus did not have to die before he got his power back. Jesus did not have to be resurrected before he got his power back. Jesus knew that the Father had given him complete power. Now, interestingly, though the Father had given him complete power, Jesus chose to remain in the state of solidarity with imperfectly powered human beings, with powerless slaves. He chose to remain in the place of a lamb, the writer said, led silently to the slaughter with no self-defense. And yet this lamb led to the slaughter, this one who was kissed and betrayed, this one who was scourged at a whipping post, this one who was hung on a cross without a fight, this one said so clearly, do you not know I could call, and I know I could call angels from heaven right now. They are teeming and leaning over the balconies of heaven with their hands on their swords, ready to unsheath them. But Jesus maintained the place of powerless solidarity by refusing that clear access that he had to the power the Father had given him. In other words, the Father gave it to him and said, it's yours to use. But Jesus whispered, nevertheless, not my will, but thine, the will of love. And he refused that gift of power. And in the moment that he knew the Father had given him complete power. He got up. Folks, don't miss this. With the knowledge that this exercise of humility was about to end, that this exercise of humility could end, with the knowledge that he was going back to the heavens, back to the Father, back to his full privilege, with that knowledge knowing that in his hands, at his fingertips, was all of the power he had forfeited. He got up, thinking equality with God was not something to be grasped, thinking that personal defense and redemption was not something to be held on to or to be grasped again. Jesus emptied himself. And the Bible said as he stood up with that knowledge in tow, he took off his outer garment and he wrapped a towel around his waist. And he put some water in a large bowl. I got to go back and read it again. When he knew that the Father had given him complete power, he got up and removed his outer garment. When he knew that the Father had given him complete power, he wrapped a towel around his waist. Knowing that all of the power of the universe and outside of the universe was at his fingertips, he put some water in a large bowl. When he knew that all power was in his hands, at his fingertips, at his disposal, he stooped down to the dirty feet of his disciples. And he began washing between the toes of a man named Judas. 
And after washing between the toes of those stinking disciples, knowing that he was cleaning the feet of the man so those feet would be clean on the way to the betrayal, the Bible said he took those wet feet and with the towel, he finished the job by drying them. When he came, actually, the Bible says, John 13 says to Simon Peter, Peter looked at him incredulously and said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you don't really know what I'm doing, but later you're going to understand. 2,000 years later, I hope that we are beginning for the sake of those who have been mistreated, for the sake of those who have been unjustly distributed to with the means and the goods of this world, for the sake of those who have suffered so unjustly, I hope that we are in that later moment and we're beginning to understand. Peter looked at him and said, proving Jesus' point, Peter looked at him and said, you will never wash my feet. What looks like raw humility on Peter's part is actually the exact opposite. Peter knew what was happening here. And Peter, like many religionists, looked at Jesus and said, I don't want a religious leader who acts like this. As a matter of fact, I don't want a God who looks like this. I don't want a God, I don't want a prime example of what life is supposed to be, who humbles himself and gets down at the feet of people who betray him. I don't want that kind of God because if I have that kind of God, that means I've got to be that kind of follower. I don't want a boss like that. I don't want a leader like that. Jesus answered and said, if I don't wash you, if I don't have this relationship with you, then you really don't belong to me and I don't belong to you. At that moment, the gravity of what was happening, if not the explanation and the clear understanding, at least the gravity, the import hit Peter in such a way that Peter leaned back and humbly said, correctively said, Lord, don't just wash my feet, wash my head, wash my hands, I'm wrong. Jesus then looked at his disciples as in that very moment they argued about who was the greatest among them. As they argued in that moment about who was loved the most by Jesus. As they argued in that moment, even some of their mothers got involved arguing that when Jesus came into his kingdom, their son would be vice president or secretary of state. Jesus looked at them and said, if I have in any way been a teacher to you, then please learn this from me, what I have done for you, do for others. What had Jesus done for them? Jesus, who being in the place of privilege, Jesus, who being in the place behind the gates, in the communities, in the untouched places, in the unscathed places, Jesus, being in that place of a particular skin color, a particular gender, a particular orientation, a particular zip code, a particular income, a particular educational level. Jesus being in that place where suffering did not touch him. Look down to those that he was one with and saw them in the place of desperate suffering. And Jesus believed the best thing he could do with his position of God was to let go of all of those privileges and join in human suffering. And on his way to the cross, Jesus opened that door by stooping down to the feet of his betrayer, his doubter, his denier, and washing their feet. And then he said, if you are indeed mine, you are not greater than the one who has sent you. If you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. All right. So Jesus is now in solidarity with humankind. But there is a portent in this text. Jesus knows that he's about to go back. He knows that he's going to go back into the heavens. And so he dies as a lamb led to the slaughter. He's buried in a borrowed tomb, which is an incredible mark of humility. Not, he didn't even have his own place to be buried. He's buried in a borrowed tomb. 
But then his indomitable life, the perfect love that was in the heart of Jesus was irrepressible and the grave couldn't hold it. And so Jesus comes out of the grave. And when he comes out of the grave, he spends the next 40 days with his disciples, helping them adjust to a new reality, helping them to find Jesus differently than they had found him before, more distributable this time, not relegated to one place in one body, one bronze-skinned Galilean, but able to appear here and there. He was adjusting them to the reality that they would encounter when he came in spirit and made them the body of Christ. And in that 40-day period, he came in and out of their lives. And at the end of that 40 days of adjustment, Jesus told his followers to meet him at a mountain. The Bible says when they met him at the mountain at the end of those 40 days, it was the mount where he would very soon ascend into the heavens, his return to the Father. Listen, when they saw him there, the Bible said that they worshiped him. And as they begin to extol and venerate, as they begin to worship and laud Jesus, do you remember what happened? Jesus began to float into the heavens. Jesus began moving up, up, up into the heavens, physically returning as a sacrament of the spiritual reality that Jesus was going back to his position of a fully privileged God. And as he ascends into the heavens, the disciples, no doubt, the intensity of their worship even elevated because now they have this floating, glowing Jesus that's moving back into the heavens, back to his home. And as they worship him, angels appear to them. And I think it's so beautiful what the angels said. The angels said, why are you standing here gazing? I think it would have been uh, probably... <laughs> Um, probably a good chance that the disciples would have looked at the angels and said, we're not standing here gazing, we're worshiping God. And the angels would have said, oh, get over yourself and quit trying to be so spiritual. He doesn't want you worshiping a hole in the sky. He never asked you to worship him. He told you to go to Jerusalem because at Jerusalem, something powerful is going to happen. He's going to come back. And he's going to come back in a way that you can't possibly begin to imagine. So stop your worship. Stop venerating a hole in the sky and a God on the other side of the clouds and go to Jerusalem and become everything that Jesus has told you you're going to be. So after he's elevated into the heavens, listen to what the Gospel of Mark says. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven. And when he went up into heaven... He sat down, listen, he sat down at the right hand of God. The writer of Hebrews in the eighth chapter says it this way. Now the point of what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Jesus moved back into the heavens but he stopped short of the throne that he had once sat in. The throne being the sacrament and the symbol of God's power and privilege. The throne being the epicenter of all things God. The throne being the place for all of us in the story of old gather around and laud the one who sits there. Jesus, who left the throne, who left the embodiment of his privilege, now goes back into heaven, but he does not complete the journey because instead of getting back in the throne, Jesus refuses and sets down at the right hand of the throne. Now, the psalmist David said something about this in the 110th Psalm that I think is powerful and I think gives clarity as to why Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne instead of reassuming the position of the throne. Matthew 22 quotes this, um, 1 Corinthians 15, Hebrews 10. Several times Psalm 110 is quoted, but this is what the psalmist said. The Lord, all capitals, tetragrammaton, God, says to my Lord, small o-r-d, Messiah, perfect man. The Lord says to my Lord, the privileged God who sits in the throne says to himself who is outside of the throne, sit at my right hand 
sit down beside the throne until, until I put all of your enemies under your feet. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father because the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension did not complete his work fully. The writer of Acts said, seven days later, the Holy Spirit would fall on those at Pentecost who are waiting on Jesus to return. The Holy Ghost, the spirit of a departed being, Jesus came back to them now in spirit form. And the Bible says, Acts 2 says something that so few people ever quote, and that is this, that when Jesus moved into the heavens, Acts 2 quotes Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou here at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. And then it says that Jesus, Acts 2 says that Jesus at the right hand received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit which he now has poured out on all of us. There's some Bible trivia for you. Who is the first recipient of the Holy Spirit? Jesus. Jesus received the Holy Spirit from the Father, but again, thinking equality with God. The gifts of God were not something to be grasped and hoarded. Guess what Jesus did with the gift of God? He poured it out on all of us. And Acts 2 said they spoke in tongues. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. The church began. And now the body of Christ is no longer one man. Now the body of Christ is all of those who've been filled with the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And now as the body of Christ, we begin to move and we begin to operate and extend the message of Jesus in the earth. But where is Jesus? He's still sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father until all of his enemies have been put under his feet. His life did not do that. His death did not do that. His resurrection did not do that. His ascension did not do that. Nor did the pouring out of the Spirit and the birth of the church do that. All enemies are not yet under his feet. Here comes the home stretch. When all the enemies are under his feet, he will get up from his position at the right hand and he will move back into the throne. Listen, Revelation 3, the end time book. Jesus speaks to the church at Laodicea, which was the worst of the seven churches. And he says, I correct and punish everyone I love. I Correct and punish everyone I love. So please make up your minds to turn away from your sins. Listen, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will eat together. And everyone who wins the victory, listen, everyone who wins the victory, will sit with me on my throne. That throne that right now he's sitting at the right hand of. That throne that he refuses to go back into. Everyone who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne just as I won the victory and have sat down with my father on his throne. If you have ears... Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Jesus said, The Father told me to sit at his right hand out of the throne until all enemies are under his feet, are under my feet. When I have overcome and won the victory and all enemies are under my feet, I'm going to move back into the throne. But please hear me. That will not happen until you also are in that place of victory. Those whom I love, I will take as long as I have to to correct and allow them space to mature until eventually that you in that fully mature place, until you have overcome the enemies of God, the enemies of hatred and bias and prejudice and bigotry and injustice, all of the enemies, the ultimate enemies of love, when those enemies are not only under my feet, but when they are under your feet, I'm going to move back to the throne, but I'm not going until you can go with me. 
To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Last scripture. 1 Corinthians 15. Christ is going to rule. Christ is going to work, some translations have it. Until, sit thou here at my right hand, until thy enemies are under thy feet. Christ will rule until all of his enemies, 1 Corinthians 15, until all of his enemies are under his power. That bothered me for a long time because I thought Jesus told us to love our enemies. Why, if we are loving our enemies, does Jesus want our enemies under his feet? He does not want our human enemies under his feet. Jesus is going to put, Paul said, his enemies under his feet, under his power. The question then begs, who are these enemies of Jesus? Well, Paul explains that. Christ is going to work until he puts all of his enemies under his power. And the last enemy he destroys will be Donald Trump. The last enemy he destroys will be Saddam Hussein. The last enemy he destroys will be Adolf Hitler. The last enemy he destroys will be Satan, Lucifer, the fallen one. The Apostle Paul said, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but our true enemies are principalities and powers, systems of evil, not flesh and blood. Christ will rule not until he puts our enemies under his feet. We love them until they are no longer our enemies and they are redeemed, until they are corrected. Christ will rule until he puts his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy he will defeat will be death. His enemies are not people. They are systems of injustice and pain and suffering. And when he has put all enemies under his power, and the last enemy is destroyed, which is death. When the scriptures say that he will put everything under his power, they don't include God. God will not be put under the feet of Jesus because God, who is loving and unifying and good and kind and merciful, God is not an enemy of Jesus. So God will not be put under his feet. It was God who actually put everything under the power of Jesus. And Jesus decided to not fully grasp that power, but to use what power he had to move all of the systems beneath his feet and redeem all the people out from those systems until they were sharing with him in this goodness, in this equity, this equanimity, this equalness. And after everything, listen, after everything is under the power of God's Son, he will then put himself under the power of God who has put everything under him. And then, contemporary English version, then God will mean everything to everyone. New Revised Standard Version. And when everything is under his feet, when Christ has delivered the kingdom to the Father, when all the enemies have been put down, God will mean everything to everyone. New Revised Standard, God will be all in all. Everything will be one with God. And the systems of injustice and suffering will be no more. For death will be defeated, death will die, and death and hell, which is called the second death, will be no more. They will be gone. I used to look at this story as just a story about uh, a universal love of God that eventually is going to get all humans home. And I think it indeed indicates that, but I think it's bigger than that. And I want to come back now and just close with the context of what it means for us to live as followers of Christ in a world that is so unjust and so unfair, so inequitable. We serve a God who gave us the example of living the perfect human life, and this is what the perfect human life looks like. When you recognize your advantage, 
when you recognize the privilege and the power of your position and you recognize that there are many who do not share that. You don't grasp it, you don't hoard it, you don't hold on to it because as Frederick Buechner said, there can be no true peace for any of us until there's true peace for all of us. The perfect human leaves the privilege of power, lets go of those privileges and rights, comes down to those who are suffering, finds solidarity with them, and in that place, remembers what they learned in the place of privilege, the advantages of that place of privilege. Like Moses in, in Pharaoh's palace, they take those advantages and now they apply them and distribute them equally amongst the slaves, amongst the mistreated. They take the form of those people who are mistreated, live with them, and then after living with them, lift them out of that place, refusing to go back to their place of privilege until they can take others with them. And even if, because of their privilege, they outpace, as Jesus did, the first fruits of the resurrection, the first one to the to the cross, the first one to know these things and live these things so fully, if he really is the firstborn among many brethren, and he does outpace us, when he gets to the throne, he waits on us. In that outpacing, he stops and says, I'm not going any further until you can all come with me. That brothers and sisters at the village, is what we do with our privilege. And every one of us, to some extent, has privilege. Ray and I were talking today about the sin of complaining. In a world, in a culture like ours, our poverty is riches to so much of the world. We literally have got to learn the life of Jesus more deeply, the life that humbles itself until it can return all to the place of privilege and shared, the shared gift of God, the shared gift and goodness of God. When God, oh, I don't even, I don't even know how to say this to make it hit you the way it's hitting me in my heart right now. When God means everything to everyone and God is all, there is nothing that is not God this is why the sages said the ultimate goal of God is not the redemption of bad people. The ultimate goal of God is the divinization of all things until we are returned into the fullness of God from which we came, and God is all in all. So, I hope that makes sense. It's a lot to chew on. If you didn't put it all together, go back and look at the scriptures for yourself. This is incredibly powerful stuff. The Black, Lighters, the Black Lives Movement needs us to get this desperately, and a whole lot more needs us to get this desperately. There are so many places of injustice in this world. May we see this, may we ingest it, and may it literally become flesh in our spiritual lives. I love you guys. I will uh, hope to see you soon. Until we get to hug next, hang in there. Be good to one another. God bless you, village.